Hello, and welcome to an adventure. Um, I hope that you're all having a great week. Happy Wednesday. Uh, I hope that the audio is good today and I'm not like completely blown out, that the balance with the music is good. You know, I, I actually tried to do some of that stuff but then again, I tried last week and it didn't, it was not successful. So, um, given the fact that I, I do the levels and the mixing and all of the production on this myself, um, and yet don't have control over the technology I use, uh, is an adventure. Um, indeed, one might say an adventure uh, in running archival, archival adventures. Um, sorry, I'm gonna put on a little bit of lotion because I didn't manage to get that before I went live. Um, oh, and uh, yes, I should actually say, hi, Lord Portico, uh, hi, Hannah, hi, Fluid Anne. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, if I missed anybody, it's great to have everybody here who's here. Um, indeed, indeed, uh, today we are starting a monthly series. The last Wednesday of every month, for the foreseeable future. I, I've planned out at least through June uh, that the last Wednesday of every month will be a collection that has something to do with high energy physics. So this is the high energy physics series of Archival Adventures. And today is the first episode uh, focused on high energy physics. And if you're not aware, of like general usage for high energy physics. Now there may be and probably are connotations to the phrase that I am not aware of, but from poking around and discovering these collections and then choosing to do this entire thing, my understanding is that high energy physics is a phrase that is used for nuclear physics. Uh, it definitely was used for stuff related to uh, nuclear science in the mid-century, 20th century. Whether it applies to more than that, I don't actually know. And maybe we will learn uh, as this series progresses. Because like always, this is not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is organizing, storing, and making available the things in the archives, not the subject matter of the things in the archives, barring a couple of you know subject areas that I am more of an expert in, um, such as LGBTQ history and Black history and uh, Indigenous history and uh, like the areas that I'm actually responsible for. Uh, science and technology, not one of those areas. Uh, also, hi, Urban. Um, how are you today? Um, so. Before I, uh, before I take a, I don't know why I got completely distracted there for a second, but I did. Uh, before we take a look at the finding aid for the Robert Marshak papers, which we will be looking at today and on the last Wednesday in February, because, and you know, maybe sometime after June as well, because there's a lot. Um, <clears throat> we should probably uh, do what we normally do to start this show, and that involves me actually having things set up properly. Uh, and that is, we're gonna take a look at the um, land acknowledgement and labor recognition uh, from Virginia Tech, because um, I, you know, I didn't introduce myself. For anybody who doesn't know, um, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And I come to you with this show every Wednesday on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, as well as twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, one of those is the Twitch channel of the library where I work, and one of them is my personal Twitch channel. And I bring this show out on both channels because outreach from the archives, I can't reach too many people. So uh, anyway. Uh, so I like to start by paying attention to 
what the university has said uh, regarding some of the past injustices um, and uh, their attitude towards um, acknowledging and potentially uh, addressing them. Um, so every week we start with this. So let me do that. Um, let me just make sure it makes it up to the screen because wow, the delay is long. Uh, oh no, no. It's not that the delay was wrong, it's that I clicked at the wrong spot. Um, so last week we discovered these have been updated and um, split into two statements, rather lengthy. I'm going to take a look this week at the short versions, um, not because the lengthy ones aren't worth reading through, but because I haven't looked at the short ones. And so I think we should pay attention to what the institution is saying in the lengthy version and the short version. So last week, the long one, this week, the short one. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutaloa and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Moral, Act, uh, the Moral Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in California and other areas in the West. Uh, labor recognition. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Enslaved black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on the construction of its building. So those are the uh, most recent versions in their shortened forms. Um, I'm curious, I wasn't involved in the updates, so I don't know uh, exactly what went into deciding how to phrase them. Um, I actually don't know who was involved. I know the previous version involved the, um, the director of the American Indian and Indigenous um, like student. I can't remember the name of it right now. It's the Cultural Center. Um, but wow, my brain just went away there for a second. Um, I see things in here where I do not think that these are well worded um, with regard to, I, I don't, in some ways I don't think they're as good as the previous one. But I'm not going to go into that on here. I think it's important to pay attention because we're focused on history and oftentimes we do look at university history. Um, I think if I brought up the previous one and we looked at it, and then we looked at this, um, these are in some ways more accurate, but also in some ways seem to shift blame off of Virginia Tech uh, in ways that I'm not sure are warranted. But um, that's as deep as I'm gonna go into that aspect of this stream, because today we're focused on high energy physics. Um, Indeed, today we're looking at the Robert Marshak papers. Uh, so, who is Robert Marshak and why do we have his papers and um, what do they have to do with high energy physics? These are good questions. These are questions I did not know the answer to until I started looking um, at this collection as one that I might stream about. Um, looking at this here, it appears that we got this collection possibly sometime in 1988, uh, just based on the number. We'll see in a, in a second here. Um, this collection was processed. There's a note here, um, right here. Uh, it was created as part of the project The Global Marshak Wave and the Foundations of Modern Particle Physics 
creating greater access to the Robert E. Marshak papers at Virginia Tech. Um, so it was a grant funded project to get this material processed, uh, funded by the American Institute of Physics. Um, and that led to the initial organization and description of the materials. Um, I do know that actively right now, they are being digitized. And they're waiting for me to do this episode so I can hand them the four boxes I have today to work on digitizing some of that. Uh, whether that is part of the same grant or another one, I'm not certain. Um, but let's see here. Uh, biographical note. So who was this Robert Marshak person? Born in 1916 in the Bronx. Um, his academic ability was recognized early, and despite their poverty, his family encouraged his studies. As a result, he finished James Monroe High School at the age of 15. Um, then he enrolled at the City College of New York, a tuition-free university. I didn't know that about CCNY. Uh, that served as an exit from poverty for generations of immigrants. After one semester there, he received a Pulitzer Scholarship, which provided full tuition and a stipend, which allowed him to continue his education at Columbia University. Uh, college appears to have been a profound intellectual experience for Marshak. He initially majored in philosophy and math and served as the dance critic for the school newspaper. In his senior year, he switched to physics and came into contact with Nobel laureate I. I. Ra Rabi. Rabi? I'm not certain how to say that name. Um, Rabi was initially skeptical of his commitment to physics, but later became a friend. Uh, you may have noticed that in reading that paragraph, I had a couple of moments where I sort of paused or, or chuckled a little bit, and it's because it reads much more like a narrative biography that you would like read if you were uh, reading a biography of somebody than a typical uh, finding aid biographical note. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just not kind of the style of how ours are normally worded and it caught me off guard. Um, graduated from Columbia in 1936, went to graduate school at Cornell via a fellowship, studied with Hans Beth Again, not certain how to pronounce that name, um, who at the time was working on problems pertaining to energy production in stars, which later won uh, Beth a Nobel Prize. Marshak wrote his dissertation on energy production in white dwarf stars. His basic conclusion was confirmed about 40 years later when the white dwarf orbiting Sirius came into view. He completed his PhD in 1939 at the age of 22. Jobs, uh, see, this is where we get the, the whole narrative again. Jobs were hard to come by in the late 1930s, especially for Jewish scientists for whom positions were limited by quotas. Marshak, nonetheless, was able to get a one-year non-renewable position at the University of Rochester. Here he met, among other notables, Victor Weisskopf, uh, the future director of CERN, uh, the nuclear accelerator facility in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, during this time, a tenure-track position opened in the physics department at Rochester, which Marshak received. Teaching at the University of Rochester was interrupted by the outbreak of World War II. Marshak became involved in the war effort, as did many scientists at the time. Initially, he worked on developing radar in Boston, Massachusetts, then on the British Atomic Bomb Project in Montreal, Canada. In 1943, Marshak married Ruth Gupp, a schoolteacher in Rochester. Later, he joined the Manhattan Project, which was developing the American atomic bomb in Los Alamos, New Mexico. At Los Alamos, Marshak was a deputy group leader in theoretical physics, a rank which allowed him to be privy to the overall strategy of atomic bomb creation. After the war, he returned to the University of Rochester where he moved quickly through the ranks. He became a chair professor, uh, the Harris chair, and the head of the physics department in the 1950s. He was an active researcher, a participant at the famous Shelter Island Conference where he proposed the two Mison theory. During his 14-year championship or chairmanship of physics department, sorry, during his 14-year chairmanship, the physics department at Rochester became one of the top 10 in the country and a recognized center for advanced research in physics. 
During his years at the University of Rochester, Marshak became intensely interested in international science. He felt that science cooperation was an important first step in the quest for global peace. Member of the first delegation of approximately six American scientists to visit the USSR after the death of Stalin, met the leaders of the Soviet physics community, including Lev Landau, made more trips to the USSR during the 50s, US State Department briefings after these trips are in the files, and became an acknowledged expert on Soviet science. Um, during the 1950s, Marshak established the Rochester Conference, considered by his colleagues to be one of his most significant achievements. The conference evolved over the years into the International Conference on High Energy Physics. The Rochester Conference was instrumental in bringing together scientists from around the world and served as a model for the establishment of international conferences in other fields. One of the most challenging aspects of the early conferences was the attempt to bring real Eastern European and Soviet physicists, as opposed to KGB agents, to the meetings. This effort required Marshak to carry out intense negotiations with the U.S. State Department and with members of Congress. His other involvement in international science included participation in the establishment of the International Center on Theoretical Physics in uh, Trieste, Italy, and the International Foundation for Science in Sweden. Events at the University of Rochester received lots of publicity and brought Marshak to the attention of the search committee looking for a new president for the Community College of New York. They approached him with an offer to become president just at a time when his social conscience had been roused. He accepted the offer and became CCNY president in 1970, just at a time when the college was undergoing a vast change in demographics. Typical of Marshak, he put his full effort into the struggle to redefine the college and bring it through these crises. In addition to improving the quality of several departments, he established important new programs such as the Biomedical Center and the Legal Center, raised the funds for a new performing arts center, the Leonard Davis Center, and pushed through the construction of a $150 million academic complex. He also became involved in the debate about national education policy and science and public policy, delivering speeches on the subject, uh, served on the board of directors for Harlem Hospital and for Colonial Penn Insurance Company, um, in the end, the success of his efforts was recognized. Um, let's see. Uh, he had a stroke that affected his balance. After nine years at CCNY, he decided to return to physics and accepted an offer as a university distinguished professor here at Virginia Tech, which uh, now you know why these papers are here and not at Rochester or CCNY um, because we have a connection as well. Uh, so they moved to Blacksburg in 1979. He became president of the American Physical Society, the principal organization of physicists in the United States. Uh, he took an activist approach to the job using the weight of this society to debate Reagan, the Reagan administration on the issue of placing anti-ballistic missile system into space, uh, popular known as Star Wars. Uh, retired at the age of 75, he worked intensely on a book, Conceptual Foundations of Modern Particle Physics, after his retirement. Um, apparently, there's an interesting anecdote. Finished the final corrections on the manuscript the day before he died. Um, when he dropped the manuscript in the mailbox, he turned to his wife and said in a joking voice, It's done. Now I can die. The next day, he died in an accidental drowning on a trip to New Me er, on a trip to Mexico. Um, interesting. I, so this appears to be excerpts from a more lengthy biography. Um, anyway, we've got materials on the Shelter Island conferences, materials on the Rochester conferences. Um, those are part of series one. That is what I have for us to look at today. Uh, and then the rest of it's divided into eight more series um, that we will visit some of in the future. But uh, A to Z files, which includes correspondence as well as a number of other topics, um, but it's all like topically organized. Uh, American Physical Society records, University of Rochester records, 
personal files, organizations and research, correspondence, audio materials and oversized materials. And so I know there's more physics stuff in some of those other series and we will visit that stuff at some point in time. But today, we're gonna look at the Shelter Island Conferences and the Rochester Conferences. Um, because those are post-World War II, the beginning of international exploration and discovery around the topic of atomic physics. And so that just sounds fascinating to me and I want to see I want to see what these conferences were all about. I want to see, you know, what was it like trying to do international cooperation around a topic so important and so potentially dangerous uh, during the decade immediately following World War II. So hopefully you're interested in that because that's what we're going to look at today. Um, let me go ahead and I'm, I'm sure having me read the finding aid to you was thoroughly entertaining, but um, how about I get the top down camera going and pull some documents out and we can start looking at them. Also, if anybody knows a lot about the study of physics, um, feel free to weigh in. And as always, if, uh, if you see something listed in the finding aid that you particularly want to see, let me know so I can make sure that we get to that folder. Um, the uh, only boxes I have today are boxes one, two, three, and four. So, I honestly don't know what's, what any of it is. I have not looked. Uh, I just pulled these boxes because these were the boxes listed for series one, which is um, the, the Shelter Island Conference and the uh, Rochester Conference. Wow, Brain, thanks so much. It is actually a little bit warm in here. Um, as always, I have brought a fan with me and I may actually try and turn that on a little bit. Um, So, uh, box one or box one, folder one here. We have Shelter Island conferences, 1947 to 49. Correspondence from J. Robert Oppenheimer. Kind of buried the lead there. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, probably a name you've heard before, and happened to be the only word on the folder that was hidden by uh, the papers in the folder. So, let's see what this uh, correspondence with Oppenheimer is all about. Also, if you don't know who Oppenheimer is, uh, let me just grab a short little, uh, because I could try to extemporize about who Oppenheimer was, but also I can just run out to Wikipedia and get a very brief, like, primer. Um, an American theoretical physicist, professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, wartime head of the Los Alamos Laboratory, often credited as the, quote, father of the atomic bomb for his role in the Manhattan Project, uh, which was the World War II undertaking that developed the first nuclear weapons. Uh, so, this is correspondence with Oppenheimer. Shelter Island Conferences on the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, 1947 to 1949. Correspondence from J. Robert Oppenheimer, arranged chronologically. The Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, New Jersey, December 10th, 1947. Dear Bob, Early last June, at the Ram Island Conference, we agreed that it would be desirable to meet again 
sometime within the year. Dr. Richards has assured me that the National Academy of Sciences would be glad again to sponsor the meeting and will make funds available to us, which should be ample. A suggested date for the meeting uh, would be the three or four days following Easter Monday, that is March 30th and 31st and April 1st and 2nd. No definite plans have been made for the place of meeting, but it seems sensible to try to hold it at some nearby country inn where we can be together and undisturbed. Would you let me know whether you think the time of the meeting generally suitable, whether the specific dates seem convenient, and whether you have any suggestions as to the place of the meeting which you would like us to take into account. Yours sincerely, Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and down there at the bottom, so there's an asterisk, uh, seems sensible to try to hold it at some nearby country inn, um, and the asterisk is apparently here. Uh, so, okay, let's see, that was, hmm. somebody has notated on it, SI1 and 2. This one just says Shelter Island Conference 1. Um, the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics Outline of Topics for Discussion, J. Robert Oppenheimer. <clears throat> it was long ago pointed out by Nordheim that there is an apparent difficulty in reconciling on the base, basis of usual quantum mechanical formula uh, usual quantum mechanical formalism, the high rate of production of mesons in the upper atmosphere with the small interactions which these uh, mesons subsequently manifest in transferring matter. All right, if anybody knows what mesons are, mesons, mesons, M-E-S-O-N-S, um, and wants to share that in chat, that would be lovely. Otherwise, I will try to remember to look it up um, after I finish glancing at this document here. To date, no completely satisfactory understanding of this discrepancy exists, nor is it clear to what extent it indicates a breakdown in the customary formalism of quantum mechanics. It would appear profitable to discuss this and related questions in some detail. We might start this discussion by an outline of the current status of theories of multiple production. Uh, some illuminating suggestions about these phenomena can be worked out in a semi-quantitative way, for instance, on the basis of the neuro, uh, neutral pseudoscalar theory of meson couplings. That's a little above my head. Hi, key squared. Oh, I'm sorry that your day's been hectic, but it's good to see you. Um, I'm actually going to try and zoom in a little bit further on this document because for me, it's a little zoomed out and I'm having trouble reading it off the screen. Um, and I've shifted the documents forward on the table, so it's also harder for me to look directly at it. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit before I continue. Uh, because, you know, I can't run the stream with things uh, arranged identically every single week. <laughs> that would be strange. No, no, I have to move, I have to change the setup subtly every week, right? That seems somewhat of a requirement. Uh, key squared. If you know anything about me mesons and um, can share a relatively simple explanation of what mesons are, we would appreciate. I will look it up if nobody shares it in chat, but I don't know specifically and uh, so have invited chat to share if they know. Um, We might start this discussion by an outline of the current status of theories of multiple production. Some illuminating suggestions about these phenomena can be worked out in a semi-quantitative way, for instance, on the basis of 
the neutral pseudoscalar theory of Meson couplings, uh, the suggested results appear to agree reasonably well as to energy dependence and multiplication, energy and angle distribution with the experimental evidence, which is admittedly sketchy. However, no reasonable formulation of theories along this line will satisfactorily account for the smallness of the subsequent interactions of mesons with nuclear matter. Similar difficulties appear when one attempts to make a theory involving couplings of meson pairs to nuclear matter. There are two reasons for these apparent difficulties. One is that in all current theory, there's a formal correspondence between the creation of a particle and the absorption of an antiparticle. The other is that multiple processes are in these theories attributable to the higher order effects of coupling terms uh, which are of quite low order, first or second, uh, in the meson wave field. The question that we should attempt to answer is whether, perhaps along the lines of an S matrix formulation, uh, both these conditions must be abandoned to accord with the experimental facts. It would be desirable to review the experimental situation with an eye to seeing how unambiguous, unambiguous current interpretations are. The calculation of the multiple production of mesons is in some ways an extension of the treatment given by Bloch and uh, Nordsay of the radiation of electrons during scattering. The difficulties of a complete description of these phenomena appear in exaggerated form in the problem of meson production. It would therefore be profitable to review the present status of the theory of radiation reaction and of certain recent suggestions for improving the theory. Ooh, this is just way over my head, but at the same time, this is J. Robert Oppenheimer uh, commenting on uh, something within physics. So I'm not surprised that it's above my head because I never studied physics past high school physics. I, I have taken a look at um, some popular works on quantum physics and I have a general understanding of uncertainty and the uncertainty principle and things like that. Uh, I've read books on um, string theory and stuff like that. Particle physics of this type, definitely not something I'm very knowledgeable about. It's been a very long time since you've had to remember what this means, and to be fair, you've forgotten it all now. They're large, comparatively heavy, compared to electrons, um, particles, generally very unstable, and they decay in a fraction of a second, usually into something sensible, like protons and neutrons. Thank you, he squared. Um, just that that was helpful uh, for my own just general edification. I am going to pull just a definition as well. For which our wonderful introductory primer on basically any topic, Wikipedia, uh, which is a great introductory primer. Uh, not good for not good for formal academics, but great for just a personal primer uh, for general use. Um, in particle physics, a meson is a type of uh, hadronic subatomic particle. Uh, thanks for that use of jargon. Uh, in particle physics, a hadron is a composite subatomic particle made of two or more quarks held together by the strong interaction. Okay. Sorry, my brain went to Star Trek. Uh, I, I know this is referring to the particles and not the Ferengi, but two or more quarks held together by the strong interaction. Um, just, wow, I really don't need multiple quarks. Um, Anyway, okay, so a meson is a type of hadronic subatomic particle composed of an equal number of quarks and antiquarks. 
usually one of each, bound together by the strong interaction. Uh, because mesons are composed of quark subparticles, they have a meaningful physical size, a diameter of roughly one uh, femtometer, which is about 0.6 times the size of a proton or neutron. All mesons are unstable, with the longest lived lasting for only a few hundredths of a microsecond. Heavier mesons decay to lighter mesons and ultimately to stable electrons, neutrinos, and photons. Okay. Also now we've introduced the uh, idea of anti-quarks, which, thinking to Star Trek, is also interesting. Probably a hollow sweet malfunction is the likely cause of multiple quarks. Probably lead to a very strong interactions with Odo's temper. It was more helpful than the definition you found on Wikipedia. Wiki left you wanting to look up half of the definition. Yeah. So the, the key squared's definition is, is very useful. Large, comparatively heavy particles, uh, generally very unstable, and they de decay in a fraction of a second usually into protons and neutrons. Um, but see now, I'm now as we discuss physics, every time the word quark comes up, I'm gonna think Star Trek, because I mean, let's face it, that's how my brain works. And um, I know quarks exist in physics, but also quark exists in, in Star Trek. So. It's just gonna be a humorous note for me as we move forward. Uh, let's see, this is the last piece of correspondence in here from J. Robert Oppenheimer. So let's see what it says, because I'm the last one was really dense, and I'm not gonna spend the time to parse it fully apart, uh, because there's a lot more that we can look at, and I think it would likely bend my brain. Um, it's just, I, I'm not sure I could uh, fully grasp it in the course of the stream, so not gonna dwell on it. Um, Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, New Jersey, January 5th, 1949. To members of the Conference on Theoretical Physics, in accordance with the agreement at the Pocono Conference, uh, Betha von Neumann and I met to discuss arrangements for a similar conference in 1949. It was agreed that the conference would be held for four days, and the dates suggested are April 11th through April 14th, inclusive. Accommodations will be held for the night of April 10th so that we may get to work on Monday morning. Arrangements have been made to hold the conference at Old Stone on the Hudson, which is about an hour by train from New York City. This is, this is a small inn which we shall have to ourselves and which seems well suited to our needs, with a little crowding. I have written to Dr. Richards, president of the National Academy of Sciences, asking whether the Academy would again be willing to sponsor and support our conference. And I have every hope for a favorable reply. In any event, the conference will be held. J.R.O. So, I mean, nothing stupendously profound, but also kind of neat to see some correspondence from J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, okay, this looks like it has some photographs in it, so I might have to grab the gloves. But uh, Shelter Island Conference, 1947, and indeed, photographs. Let me grab the gloves, uh, just so that I'm not touching developed photos with my bare hands and getting all those like skin oils on them because their skin oils are much much harsher on um, photographs than on paper that said if you ever go to an archives that does want you to wear gloves to handle really old paper you follow their policies because they are the ones charged with protecting that old paper. Here, we generally don't do the gloves for the paper because paper has ragged edges 
and cotton gloves can catch those edges and uh, tear the paper. And for most of our collections, that's generally um, less desirable than um, a little bit of oil from clean hands. Uh, because, but if, if you have documents that are like older than ours or in more fragile condition, um, they might want you to wear gloves to not get oils on, and they may even want to not have you turn pages. They may want you to use some sort of tool to turn the pages so that, yeah, so you follow the policies of the archives you visit because they're the ones who understand their materials and what their materials need. Uh, you just went and checked the Pocono Conference of 1948 was when Richard Feynman gave his first big presentation on quantum electrodynamics, which nobody understood, which led to him going back and learning how to write and teach to all our benefit. He squared, that is amazing. Um, also, I've had on my shelf a graphic novel uh, since grad school that, of course, I got distracted and have never managed to actually read um, about Feynman. Uh, it is supposed to be a, quite a good graphic novel, and I've thumbed through it. I just haven't sat down and read it because Boy, howdy, when do you find the time to do things? Um, but it is, it is on my to-read list, is my, my Feynman graphic novel. Um, it's just called Feynman. Uh, Shelter Island Conferences on the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, 1947 to 1949, photograph 1947. Um, so let's see here, there is to start with a photocopy of the photograph, um, which allowed them, by photocopying it, they were able to label the individuals in the photograph um, that they knew who they were in a very useful way by pointing to them. Um, it says that they have been ID'd by uh, George Collins, um, and that the IDs were made on January 13th, 1995. So let us take a look here at this photograph of the Shelter Island Conference held on Ju in June of 1947. Um, this is a reproduction um, and can anyone tell me how I know it's a reproduction? Um, I'm going to actually adjust the zoom level slightly uh, to give you all a better chance of um, telling me why I know this is a reproduction. But uh, yeah, it's a reproduction. And I could tell it's a reproduction uh, because it's very clearly a, an old torn photograph that has been photographed and printed onto photo paper. Which, okay. So this is a photograph of a photograph from 1947. Um, you could tell because it was sitting on some sort of grid when they took the photograph of the photograph. Anyway, it's a picture of the conference from 1947. Um, and we have uh, this person over here is labeled as Iribi. I don't know who, who I, that's not a name I recognize, but I-R-R-I-B-I. -I. Um, the tall person standing right in front of the painting is George Uhlenbach, which is a name I do recognize, but don't really know anything about him. 
Uh, next to him, this shorter gentleman with the dark hair in the dark suit. Well, okay, that describes almost everyone in the photo. Um, this person is uh, Schwinger, S-C-H-W-I-N-G-E-R. And then the, there's a group of people with their names identified. Isidore uh, Ravi. Okay, won the Nobel for the research that led to the MRI. So Isidore Rabi is I-R-R-I-B-I. -I. That's the same person. I'm not... Interesting, because if I type it in as labeled into Google, it's like, did you mean Robbie? Uh, so you're probably correct as to who it is. You heard I I R I B I. No, uh, and the thing is, you're probably right as to who it is. Um, I'm really curious. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of Isidore. I think... Yeah, I, it looks like him, so it probably is. Um, that's probably who it is. I'm, I'm curious as to why it's labeled in the way that it is. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Uh, then we, okay, so this guy here holding the piece of paper is John Wheeler, um, who is another person I'm, I'm unfamiliar with in physics. Uh, we've got Hans Fader. Um, Julian Serber. Uh, way back here, the guy who you can just see his head, that's Robert Marshak, whose papers we're looking at. Ooh, uh, the Segre archive has the same photo with different typos in the description. <laughs> Q squared, that's amazing. Um, but this guy here by the curtain, that's Robert Marshak, whose papers we're looking at. Um, and standing next to him is Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and then ducked back here so that you can just barely see his face, that's Feynman. That's Richard Feynman. Most of the people in the photograph are not named in, in the uh, IDs that I have in here. Um, but that's a pretty cool photo of some of the people that were big in like the Manhattan Project and, and theoretical physics um, during the time immediately following World War II. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. This is Shelter Island Conference, June 1947, World War II. Uh, my brain does not want to tell me dates, um, 19, uh, of when it ended. Okay, I was right, it was 1945. Um, I thought it was 45 that it ended. So this is just like two years, honest, it's less than two years after the end of World War II. Because World War II officially ended in September, and this is Jul June, uh, so yeah. Sorry, slight distraction on a, a, over to my left here. Uh, let's move on to the next. Um, next 
older. Wheeler, who's next to Beth, was doctoral advisor for several of your professors. Okay, see, now I have to pull the photo back out. Because that is a cool note. Uh, bear with me just one second here. I need to fix the thing. Okay. Uh, so Wheeler was So you actually said he's standing next to um, Beth, which Beth wasn't even identified in the photo. Uh, Wheeler is this person and so is this um, Betha because this person is Fader but but that's kind of cool that Wheeler was doctoral advisor for some of your professors I'm going to stop being distracted by uh, things now. Just things came up. Uh, first Rochester Conference, 1950. Okay, this one, who knows if this will be terribly interesting, this folder, uh, because it, the subcategory or the subtitle of this folder is Institutional Sponsorship. Um, indeed, Lord Portico, you are not incorrect. I could use a hydration. Um, I also have a cord that is catching weirdly, so. There. Shadows of life, thank you for redeeming a stretch. I will do so. It's almost unheard of for somebody to redeem a stretch on this stream. But I do appreciate it because I do forget to stretch. And then I, I get to the end of this stream and I realize that I've slowly hunched throughout the stream and that my back hurts. So I appreciate the, uh, the stretch reminder. Um, okay. So when they were processing these, it appears that they added in this like cover page for each folder. Um, I don't know for certain though. Those cover pages might have been there when the papers came to us, but I suspect that they were added as part of the processing, um, which is unusual, but this was a grant-funded processing project, so maybe there were specific requirements or requests from the physics organization that uh, funded it. Uh, we have University of Rochester High Energy Physics Conference, Rochester, New York, December 16, 1950, institutional sponsorship arranged alphabetically by correspondent. So we're going to read some, some people's mail, it looks like which is always fun, uh, reading old mail. Yeah, I think, trying to figure out how far this letter went. Oh, no, actually, this is the whole 
No, it's not. Now I'm talking to myself. Sorry. Of course, this is a copy. Not terribly surprising that this is a copy. Um, oftentimes in archives, we do end up with co copies. I almost said coffees, but um, we generally try not to bring the coffees into the archive. Uh, redeemed, then a moment later, gained the mask back. Oh, that's awesome, Shadows. Um, so this is a letter uh, signed George Collins, um, who I don't know his sort of reputation in um, particle physics. Uh, does, does anybody know who's George Collins with regard to particle physics? Computer is doing some slightly strange things. One second. George B. Collins. Physicist, particle experimentalist, educator, and administrator. Earned a PhD with R. W. Wood at Hopkins, studying UV spectroscopy. A professor at Notre Dame, working on nuclear excitation and disintegration. Responsible for the construction of a nuclear accelerator for the no Notre Dame Nuclear Physics Lab in 1935. Worked with Dr. Jose Caparo. Uh, in 1935, the accelerator was Notre Dame's largest nuclear physics-related project. To that date, accelerator was the source of several decades research on nuclear physics, much of which was headed by Collins. Uh, at MIT, he assisted the war effort in the radiation laboratory developing radar for military purposes. Uh, he taught at the University of Rochester and served the Department of Physics as chairman. He was in charge of construction and operation of the 240 MEV synch synchrocyclotron and initiated with Robert Marshak the Rochester conferences chairman of Brookhaven's Cosmotron Department and a Fulbright Fellow in Belgium. Um, and the reason I know that much is he, late in his career, he came to Virginia Tech and taught physics. And we have his papers. And they will be some of the papers that we look at as we proceed with our high energy physics series. So um, probably, I, I don't know for certain, probably March or April. Uh, is when I have his papers scheduled. Um, I thought I had that window open. I apparently do not. It's fine. It's totally fine. This is, there's, this is fine. That is not the spreadsheet I needed. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to figure out when we're going to look at Collins's papers. Part two, part three is cruise, part four is nuclear winter. Uh, May 31st is when we're looking at the, the George Collins papers. <laughs> Not a name you knew, but Oh no, go enjoy your physics experiment, key squared. Uh, hopefully, um, hopefully, I'm gonna say hi to VOD key squared and hopefully VOD key squared actually showed up to watch this um, as a video on demand. Um, all right, so uh, this is to Provost Donald W. Gilbert. Dear Don, this is a proposal to hold an International Conference on High Energy Physics here during the month of June or July 1950. This conference would be held in collaboration with the Office of Naval Research. Bob Marshak and I have talked this over at some length and believe that in a year and a half from now such a conference will be quite timely from the standpoint of reporting 
new results obtained here with the big cyclotron. Um, I need I need zoom in. Too many buttons to click. I apologize. I'm trying not to be super distracted. Um, sounds fun. Okay. All right, here we go. Bob Marshak and I have talked this over at some length and believe that in a year and a half from now, such a conference will be quite timely from the standpoint of reporting new results obtained here with the big cyclotron. Together with some of our cosmic ray research, the topic is one of overriding importance in physics and is sure to attract the leading physicists of the world unless someone else has the conference first. In brief, here is the general plan. The conference would be a five-day affair, four days of conference and one day of trip to Cornell, uh, etc. Attended by about 100 invited physicists, about 20 of them from outside this country. We aim to invite only physicists who are actively engaged in research involving high energy particles. Energy greater than 100 million electron volts. The university would have to pay partial or full expenses for foreign visitors, and it is assumed the Navy will pay expenses for those coming from within the country. This last point will, of course, be verified before committing the university in any way. As planned, the cost to the university would be about $7,500. Um, how much would that be today? Because I can tell you, a hundred invited physicists, uh, some of whom, uh, 20 of them from outside the country, um, with the university covering the cost of travel, for the people coming from outside the country would cost a lot more than $7,500 and would not be funded by the university. Uh, they would have had to write a grant proposal and get a grant from a granting agency in order to fund the cost necessary to bring in those international physicists if they were doing this today. There is absolutely no way. $7,500 seems super inexpensive to me, but it was probably a good sum of money back in uh, 1949. Attached to this letter is a tentative agenda for the meeting. Together with a list of foreign physicists we would probably wish to invite, three of the topics listed on the agenda would occupy a full day and two a half day. There would be morning and afternoon sessions, each having a discussion leader. The discussion leaders indicated our authorities in their field and would be asked to assume the responsibility of arranging their section of the program. This scheme is being tried out at a cosmic ray conference to be held this coming summer. The discussion leaders would be invited first and perhaps a year ahead of time. Uh, if they accept, their presence assures the success of the conference. If many of them do not accept, we could call the conference off with little embarrassment. These discussion leaders would be paid full expenses, uh, that is $650 each. Following acceptance by these key people, we would offer travel plus expenses from the port of entry to the United States to Rochester, that is about $150 each, for foreign scientists of somewhat lesser importance for the success of the conference. Finally, to give a true international flavor to the conference and to contribute to international understanding, uh, we would like to invite a famous Russian physicist by the name of Vexler. This will cost $1,000. What is this asterisk? Okay to contribute to international understanding, asterisk, Education in a Divided World, Chapter 2 by James B. Conant. Uh, I, that's great. Uh, hi, Iron Trout, thank you. Google says that $7,500 um, in 1949 dollars is about $100,000 today. That seems much more reasonable as to what the cost 
uh, would be, and and yeah, there's no way you get a hundred thousand dollars to help found a conference on anything uh, at a university today. You're gonna need that hundred thousand dollars to come from a granting agency somehow. Um, here is the cost summary. Six discussion leaders at $650, totaling $4,000. 14 foreign visitors at $150, totaling $2,000. Vexler from Russia, $1,000 by himself. Incidental expenses, $500. That's going to cover like printing programs or things like that. Um, for a total of $7,500. This would be an important conference. The scientists named are the world's most famous, and one might expect the attendance of approximately five Nobel Prize winners. At the same time, I believe the quality of the research in physics in progress here is such that these men would carry away with them a good impression of the university. Sincerely, George B. Collins. Enclosure. Imagine being able to fly someone in from Europe and put them up for 150. Yeah, and that's including the cost of travel from the port of entry to the school. So it's not just, it's the airfare, it's the airport shuttle or bus or whatever is necessary to get them from the port of entry to the school, and then the cost of putting them up. Which even if that cost, like even if they're sticking them in residence hall rooms because it's July and school is out, uh, there's cost. And I don't think that's what they were doing. I think they're sticking them in hotels. But International Conference on High Energy Physics, uh, meeting for five days in June or July 1950. One, experiments with electron accelerators. R. R. Wilson, E. McMillan. Experimental tests on, of quantum electrodynamics at high energies, exploration of nuclear structure, electron nucleon interaction, production of mesons. Two, experiment, experiments with proton accelerators. Oliphant and Robbie, uh, nucle nucleon nucleon scattering experiments, interaction of nucleons with nuclei, production of mesons. 3A, properties of mesons, Powell. Mass spectrum spins, lifetimes, and decay products of various types of mesons, interaction with each other and with electrons. 3B, theory of nuclear forces. Uh, Pirels? P E I E R L S. Spin, exchange and tensor character. Velocity dependence of nuclear forces, status of meson field theory. Four, special processes in cosmic ray uh, energy region. Blackett and Auger. Large air showers, penetrating showers nuclear interactions of various types of cosmic ray primaries. I don't know what large air showers are with regard to cosmic rays, but... I also don't want to bog down too much, so if anybody's particularly curious about what that meant, uh, let me know and, and we can figure it out. But. Uh, in, otherwise, I'm going to move on and look at some more of this correspondence. We've got a letter here, November 20th, 1950, uh, from Robert Marshak, Chairman of Department of Physics at University of Rochester, to uh, Mr. Paul Rutherford, General Manager, Delco Appliance Division, General Motors Corporation, Rochester, New York. Um, Delco, I don't know their reputation within physics. I know them primarily from being one of the major manufacturers of parts for NASA um, in like the 1950s and 60s. NASA and NACA. Um, Dear Mr. Rutherford, you will recall hearing from Mr. Joseph Wilson about the physics department program for bringing distinguished physicists to the university for visits of one or two weeks duration and of holding informal one or two day conferences on the latest developments in physics. 
I am happy to inform you that the initial events in this new program are a one-day conference on high-energy physics to be held December 16, 1950 in the Physics Building, and a week-long visit December 16 to 23, 1950 by Professor Wolfgang K. H. Panofsky of, from the University of California. Uh, apart from participating actively in the conference on December 16th, Pro Professor Panofsky will deliver two lectures on recent experiments with the atom smashing machines at Berkeley on December 18th and 20th at 4 p.m. in the physics building. We shall be very happy to have interested scientists from your company attend both the conference and the lecture. I am enclosing six copies of the invitation, which has recently gone out to about 100 top physicists throughout the United States and I expect a sizable turnout. The invitation is self-explanatory, and I should appreciate it if you, or someone you deputize, will distribute the invitations to the proper persons. If you would like to have more people attend, please send me their names and invitations will go out to them. I might point out that at this first conference there will be present all the leaders of the high-energy laboratories throughout the country, and that it will be the first conference of this sort financed by non-government funds. Delke makes a lot of high voltage, high current switch gear for extreme industrial applications. I did not know that. I really only knew them for the NASA stuff, but I could see the crossover of, of why they might also do high energy stuff. Uh, let me see here what else we've got. Um, I think that's just a photocopy of the, the yellow paper that we just read. Um, this is excerpts from a letter to Mr. Joseph Wilson. Um, a letter to the, ha the Haloid Company, manufacturers of fine photographic products. Um, Rochester Gas and Electric Corporation. I want to see. These are essentially like letters of invitation to people, but I don't want to bog down in these because there's a lot more stuff. And this is only like the second folder, third folder, something like that. Um, Yeah, yeah, I'm going to move on from, from this folder, unless somebody screams really loud, and see what the next one is. First Rochester Conference Invitation Correspondence. Arranged alphabetically by correspondent. Uh, we'll flip through, we'll glance at names, if there are any particularly famous names, we might stop and read the letter. Uh, but these are invitations. So, dear colleague, boy, they're really famous, right? Colleague, I, I mean, you hear their name all the time. Uh, dear colleague, I'm enclosing a list of persons who've indicated their attention of attending. We'll look at this list, but a list of persons who have thus far indicated their intention of attending the Rochester Conference. Uh, if you've not returned your postcard to Miss, Mrs. Arnfelt, please do so at your earliest convenience. Oh gosh, sorry. I should, I should bump this up so you can see it better. Uh, Mrs. Arnfelt informs me that if you have requested a hotel reservation, your hotel is the Seneca, unless otherwise specified. In view of the large number of conference participants, I should like to remind you that the physics building will be open all day Sunday, December 17th, to accommodate post-conference meetings. The accelerator people may wish to schedule a special session on operational problems. The theorists may want to schedule a special seminar and so on. Please keep these possibilities in mind. Sincerely yours, Robert E. Marshak. Participants in Rochester High Energy Physics Conference as of December 7th, 1950. So still a couple weeks before the conference. We have H.L. Anderson from Chicago, S.W. Barnes from Rochester, G. Bernardini from Columbia, H.A. Beth from Cornell, E.T. Booth from Columbia, 
G. Bright from Yale, K. M. Case from Michigan, G. F. Chu from Illinois, H. R. Childs, Rochester, D. R. Corson, Cornell, J. W. DeWire, Cornell, B. T. Feld, MIT, D. Feldman, Rochester, H. Feshbach, MIT, R. P. Feynman, Caltech, uh, V. H. Frankel, General Electric, uh, J.B. French, Rochester, H.W. Fulbright, Rochester, R.L. Garwin, Chicago, M.L. Goldberger, Chicago, K. Grison, Cornell, A.O. Hansen, Illinois, S. Hayakawa, Cornell, R.B. Holt, Harvard, T.H. Johnson, Brookhaven, D.W. Kirst, Illinois, I recognize a lot of these names, um, S. Kikuchi, Cornell, W. L. Uh, Krauschar, MIT, A H. Craybill, Yale, U. Liddell, O. N. R., um, C. Longmire, Los Alamos, R. E. Marshak, Rochester, B. D. McDaniel, Cornell, uh, P. Morrison, Cornell, L. W. Nordheim, Los Alamos, J. R. Oppenheimer, Institute for Advanced Study, C.L. Oxley, Rochester, A. Uh, Pai, Institute for Advanced Study, W.K.H. Panofsky, uh, California, V.L. Persegian, AEC, J.B. Platt, AEC, H.C. Pollock, General Electric, H. Primakoff, MIT, J. Rainwater, Columbia, N. Ramsey, Harvard, R. Rao, Princeton, G. Reynolds, Princeton, D. M. Ritson, Rochester, A. Roberts, Rochester, uh, F. Norlick, Cornell, B. Rossi, MIT, J. Ravina, Rochester, E. Salant, Brookhaven, E. Salpeter, Cornell, uh, G. Salvini, Princeton, R. D. Sard, Washington University, R. Scaletter, Rochester, M. M. Shapiro, Naval Research Lab, R. P. Shutt, Brookhaven, G. M. Temer, Rochester, uh, J. Tinlot, Rochester, S. N. Van Voorhees, Rochester, F. Villers, MIT, A. Wattenberg, Illinois, M. G. White, Princeton, A. S. Whiteman, Princeton, R. W. Williams, MIT, R. Wilson, Cornell, R. Wilson, Rochester, uh, w. M. Woodward, Cornell, C. L. Yuan, Brookhaven, and H. Yuxua, Columbia. There's a lot of names, and I, did, I didn't recognize all of them by any chance, but I recognized a lot of them. Um, next to Alexander Peavy. I'm just looking now to see who these are all for. You went to a Brookhaven High School? Um, I don't know what institution, I'm assuming some sort of like Brookhaven University or something like that, although some of them were institutes, um, except that, is it Brookhaven Institute? See, now I have to look. Uh, nope, it's Brookhaven National Laboratory. It is a research institute, so Brookhaven Institute. Um, Located in Upper Upton, Long Island, formally established in 1947 as the site of Camp Upton, a former U.S. base and Japanese internment camp. Um, it's a Department of Energy laboratory now. Uh, let's see, this is from BB. Bernardini. Hans Betha, which Key Squared knew the name of. I, I still don't know how to pronounce this name. Uh, December 9th, 1950. Dear Bob, we're making plans for our trip to, trip to Rochester. At present, with Ro both Rose and I are planning to come and we intend to drive. We would leave about 1 p.m. from here so that we would be in Rochester about 3.30 p.m. Friday afternoon. Uh, I should 
I, I should prefer not to give a colloquium at this time because the meetings will be so concentrated that I would rather not add more talk to it. Probably there will be some occasion in the early spring when I would come again and might talk to your colloquium. It would be nicer, I believe, if we could have the afternoon for peaceful discussion of physics. Rose would prefer to leave after the evening session on Saturday, but her preference is slight. Do you know what Oppie's timetable is? Will he leave Saturday night or stay over until Sunday? This might have some influence on our decision. Rose plans to make an appointment with, the ch with a child psychologist for Friday afternoon, so Ruth should not make any plans for that time. Sincerely, Hans. I love... Do you know what Oppie's sat uh, plans are? Or timetable is referring to J. Robert Oppenheimer as Oppie. Um, from E.T. Booth, Columbia University. A rather formal acceptance. Dale R. Corson of Cornell. Oh, this is, this is cute. So this is the formal acceptance that went to Mrs. Arnoff's, or, or Mrs. Arnfelt. Um, and then there's a handwritten note direct, uh, addressed to Bob, so uh, Robert Marshak, November 24th, 1950. Dear Bob, we have invited Panofsky uh, to come here on Monday following your conference on Saturday the 16th. He has agreed to come provided we can get your permission. Uh, so will you let him come? We can pay any extra travel expenses involved. Sincerely, Dale Corson. Um, so, Cornell University wanted one of the scientists to come after the conference was done, but he wouldn't do it unless he had permission. That's interesting. Uh, Haloid Company. Feynman! Including signature. Received December 13, 1950. Professor Robert Marshak, University of Rochester. Uh, Dear Bob, okay, I'll stick around a couple of days more and talk things over. We'll worry about what the, lecture, what the lectures are later. In the meantime, something general, like field theory or something, will do as a, as a title, I guess. Um, you make the title, I'll talk on it. <laughs> signed Dick uh, Professor R.P. Feynman Recent developments in quantum field theory Monday 4 p.m. in 404 uh, Rush Rees Tuesday 2 p.m. and then I love in pencil at the bottom Feynman signed it because that is Feynman's signature um, I love that it's it's had a frame drawn around it and partly erased. That's cute. But also, the end of his note, he wrote, Dick. I did not know Richard Feynman went by Dick. Now I do. Kenneth Grison. I know that name, but I'm not going to try and read um, that handwriting right now. Uh, it would take me a bit to parse. So I'm going to move on from there. Oh, a telegram. Who's this from? Cursed. DW Cursed. Hope it's not too late. When is the date on this telegram? November 13th, they were still inviting people on December 7th. This telegram is dated November 13th and DW Kirst was concerned that it was already too late to accept the invitation to the conference. Don't make the joke. Oh, shadows. I, I understand. Um, more from D.W. Kirst, Wolfgang Panofsky, 
via airmail, December 11, 1950. To Professor Robert Marshall. Dear Bob, I just received your request this morning to give you some of the topics I might be willing to say a few, few words on. One, results of the absorption experiments in hydrogen and deuterium. We have a greatly improved deuterium curve. Two, photo production of neutral mesons. Three, angular distribution of uh, N positive mesons from proton proton collisions, worked by Richmond, Cartwright, Peterson, Skinner, and Whitehead. Four, energy measurement of Sarnikov radiation, or sorry, Sarenkoff uh, radiation. Actually, I think it's Cherenkoff, isn't it? Isn't that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Work by R. Mather of experimental interest only. Five, I think it's Cherenkoff, but Plons? Oh, it might be Pi. Oh, Pi. Yeah, it does. It looks like Pi positive mes mesons. I did not know that pions were a thing. Key squared, thank you. Back from testing Hooke's law for the n thousandth time, f continues to equal negative kx. I, I should, I don't know. I don't really know anything about Hooke's law. I'm curious as to whether we have anything in our collections about Hooke's law. Since you bring it up, and I know it's not the first time you've brought it up, I'm now curious. Nothing in our finding aids. So it would be published works if I had something. Um, from the 1600s, Ah, but wait, I probably do then, and it is probably in published works. In fact, now that I think about it, when we looked at, um, uh, oh, where were they? Hang on. I'm looking at my old titles for last year's. When we did uh, Herschel, Somerville, and Marset, the three 19th century women scientists, uh, when I did that episode, I believe one of them and one of the published works of theirs that we looked at uh, touched on Hooke's Law. But it, it, I might be wrong. But I want to say that it did. I mean, we have materials in our collections dating back to um, uh, the 1400s. So it's not out of the question, but also not surprising that we don't. Because we don't have a lot of material that old uh, other than published volumes. But, but yeah, we do have some items in, in the collection that date back to the 1400s. Um, Hooke and Newton were contemporaries and hated each other. I did not know that. Uh, let's see, evidence for quasi-elastic scattering, that is internal elastic and uh, neutron proton and proton proton scattering inside a nucleus, work by Cladis and Hadley. Uh, I shall be prepared to present numerical data on the various results. I have written to Mrs. Uh, unfelt concerning my time of arrival, and I believe you have made reservations for me at the Sheraton Hotel. However, you say in your circular letter that the hotel is the Seneca. I would appreciate information on this point. If it is too late to contact me here, you can contact me at Urbana, care of Professor uh, Arne Nordsake, on fr Friday, December 15th. Uh, let's see, Norman Ramsey, Irving Resnick. The fact that Robert Hooke figured out the physical laws for the behavior of springs, which in the lab are often hung on hooks, is a source of glee. None of which has anything to do with meson scattering, alas. Oh, but 
it's great that you're uh, excited about it. I, I love that you bring that enthusiasm. Uh, George Reynolds. Popping through just in case there's another Oppenheimer letter for some reason. Um, Maurice Shapiro or another name that just like jumps out like randomly Einstein has a letter which I don't think is going to be here because um, that totally would have been mentioned in the finding aid. Uh, Maurice Shapiro. This is uh, Hideki Yunkawa, whose handwriting is not terribly easy to read, but our collections are severely lacking in anything representing any uh, Asian or Asian American history. So. And that is most definitely a Japanese name. So I now want to know who this person is and take a look at their, their correspondence here. Um, Hideki Yunkawa was a Japanese theoretical physicist and the first Japanese Nobel laureate for his prediction of the Pi Meson, or Pion, which Key Squared just brought up the existence of Pions. And here we have the person who got a, a letter from the person who got the Nobel Prize for predicting them. Um, no postcard came is noted on here, so we'll see what that's all about. November 16th, 1950. Dear Professor Marshak, thank you very much for your kind invitation to the conference on high energy physics. I am sorry to be a little too late in... Uh, in Considering your letter, asterisk, uh, this was because there were so many visitors from Japan who came to see me since I came back from Japan early in September. Um, but I am very glad to attend the conference. Probably you know already Dr. Kikuchi. Uh, Dr. S. Kikuchi and Professor Y. Hayakawa, who have been staying at Cornell University. They will be very happy if they will be able to attend the meeting. Uh, Hayakawa may not be able to stay until December, but uh, Kikuchi will certainly be at Cornell at that time. I mean, it's just a simple like acceptance of an invitation, but these are the kinds of things like that letter, if there was a scholar um, studying Hideki Yunkawa's work. The fact that uh, he was invited to the first Rochester conference, that he accepted, and that in his acceptance he also referenced two other Japanese scientists as being interested in attending, is something that could potentially be really interesting to a scholar. I don't know how much of that is widely known. I don't know. Everything in that letter may have been like well-known history. There might not have been anything unique or interesting there. Um, but who knows? I'm not a scholar of this subject matter. I'm not a scholar of that physicist. If somebody was studying him, that letter could potentially be really interesting because it proves that he knew Kiki, Kikuchi and um, oh okay so wait the S because there was a Seishi Kikuchi and a Chihiro Kikuchi working in the field at that time. Interesting because this um, 
I thought that the letter said Kikuchi. But if S, oh, you typoed. OK. So they're both Kikuchi. It's uh, Seishi Kikuchi and Chihiro Kikuchi. And so this, the S was to specify. But like here, this proves, like for a scholar, this is primary source documentation that Yunkawa was at least aware of Kikuchi and Hayakawa. Now, whether that was already widely known or not, I have no idea. If it wasn't, that could be very important to have that primary source documentation showing that they knew one another, or at least were aware of one another. My guess is it's not super rel revelatory, but again, I'm not a scholar of these people, so I don't really know. Wow, we've got about 15 minutes, according to my watch. Attendee lists. So I'm going to start flipping through and see what we got. Um, scientific program. That could be interesting. Administration. Public relations. That'll be cute to look at, I think. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to get past the first Rochester conference today. Um, I'm totally okay with that. We are revisiting this, this collection in a month, and we can continue with further Rochester conferences um, and maybe go through them a, a little bit faster. But this first one is like a who's who of early work in atomic physics. So it's kind of exciting. Um, University of Rochester, High Energy Physics Conference, Rochester, New York, December 16, 1950, scientific program, arranged chronologically. BI, first program. I, I don't know what that means, but um, ran morning, afternoon, and evening, December 16, 1950, Rochester High Energy Physics Conference program one. I, I love, um, I assume most of the people who watch this program immediately recognize the um, mimeographed pages, uh, but if for some reason uh, you don't know what mimeographed pages are, I know these are mimeographed because Actually, I, they do look mimeographed, but let me look. This is watermarked, except, so they, they look mimeographed. Mimeographed tends to have this sort of um, softer edges to the letters with a purpley ink, um, and it's a very specific copying machine. I actually, taking a second look at it, don't think that these are mimeographed. This page has a watermark on it for the A1 core duplicator. Um, and now that I'm on this topic, I have to take a look and see what that is. Uh, come on. Maybe it's Alcor duplicator? I don't know. Huh. Well, it doesn't really matter. It just caught my 
attention. Um, it's so the watermark says Alcor duplicator dual use. Oh no, I found it. Um, Except it doesn't have any information. It's I found somebody who's got a book of this paper for sale. Hmm. Well, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, it looks mimeographed, but the paper made me think that it might have been like a carbon copy paper. Uh, iron trout, yes. That was, that was where my brain was going, was that it looks mimeographed, but it could also be carbon paper. And the fact that it's somewhat glossy on one side um, and had that watermark about duplicator, dual use, makes me think that maybe this was actually carbon paper and not mimeograph. Um, which is why after I went off on talking about mimeograph, I was like, eh, let's pull that back and, and confirm. Nothing to do with the conference, honestly. Uh, just technology. Um, so, the conference started uh, 10 to 12 a.m. One, experiments with nucleons and um, ah, gosh, I don't know my Greek lowercase letters. Uh, thank you, key squared. Mu mesons. Mesons. Mu mesons. Honestly, I don't know my capital Greek letters either. Um, I know the Greek alphabet, like the letters, but only some of them do I have the symbols associated with their names. Like I know all the names, only some of them do I have the, the symbols associated and um, lowercase I basically don't know. So experiments with nucleons and mu mesons uh, by, uh, let's see, Chairman and Pai, uh, proton proton scattering, 110 MeV and 240 MeV. First year quantum students have a good time mewing at each other in the hallways at this point in the syllabus. That is adorable and amazing. Uh, what? What does MEV stand for? I know I've come across it a couple times recently. Um, it came, uh, there was at least one spot earlier in the papers we were looking at. Um, it came up when I was doing the blog post that I put up last Thursday about the nuclear reactor here at Virginia Tech. Uh, mega electron volt, thank you. It's a unit of energy. Yeah, I just, ha I, I was so busy writing the article about like, the installation and funding and uh, of the nuclear reactor, the uh, radiological incident that happened on campus, and then the later uh, decommissioning and removal of the nuclear reactor, that I never had time to stop and look up what MEV meant. So, an electron volt is enough energy to raise an electron through one volt of potential. So it's a tiny amount of energy, but mega and giga electron volts are rather larger, um, as m the prefixes mega and giga would imply. Uh, so Ramsey from Harvard was talking about the 110 mega electron volt and Oxley the 240, and then uh, their presentations were 10 minutes and five minutes, followed by 40 minutes of discussion. Uh, and then interaction of nucleons with nuclei, proton-induced stars, um, 110 MeV, 240 MeV, and 385 MeV, 5 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, followed by quasi-elastic scattering, Panofsky, 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes of discussion. And we've got a rate coming in from 16-bit Eric. 16-bit um, Eric, Welcome, hello, Rim hello, Whimsies. It is great to have you join us. I hope that you're all having a great day. Um, if anybody was here who is not following 16-Bit Eric, you should follow 16-Bit Eric. 
16-Bit Eric is a wonderful streamer, a wonderful human, and has a wonderful community. Um, if you're at all interested in, let's see, oceanography, sharks, uh, video games, tabletop role-playing games, um, space science fiction, uh, LGBTQ plus issues, um, Buddhist thought, uh, then it's worth a follow. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, welcome in everybody. General awesomeness. Hi, Wolf Shade, thank you. Um, if you're into awesome people, and Eric raids over here quite often, so thank you. Um, today we are, I'm, I'm doing my very first of a series of streams. These will be every last Wednesday of um, every month going forward, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And so the final Wednesday of every month is part of a series on high energy physics. Uh, today we've been looking at the um, the Robert Marshak papers. Wow, the name just left my brain. We've been looking at the Robert Marshak papers. Marshak was one of the founders of the Rochester Conference, which today is known as the International Conference on High Energy Physics. And um, actually, basically the whole stream today, we looked a little bit at the conference that preceded it um, and some correspondence with J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, but then we've just been looking pretty much entirely at the first Rochester conference in 1950. Um, at the end of February, we will return to this collection and look further at the Rochester conference as it has evolved over the years. Um, we've honestly, it's been spot the name for famous physicists today. Um, and it's, it's been a, a, quite a lot of fun. Um, one of the earlier things we looked at, just for those who arrived with the raid, was a lovely photograph of attendees at the Shelter Island Conference three years prior, um, which was just pretty, pretty cool. Like this is, um, this is Rami over on the side there. I only have certain names that were labeled. Uh, and they're all like famous physicists. Uh, George Uhlenbeck, Schwinger, John Wheeler, Hans Fader, uh, Julian Serber, Robert Marshak, Robert Oppenheimer, and Richard Feynman. So, yeah, check the VOD for Feynman's note. We did have a, a um, acceptance of the invitation to the conference uh, signed by Richard Feynman. Um, so it's been, it's been a fun day today so far. For scale, biggest accelerators now are in the hundreds of giga electron volts, uh, but at that time, 385 mega electron volts was a lot. So Booth uh, from Columbia was, was lecturing on that. Um, let's see, so we have mu mesons. Uh, I do not know how to read this. Is that mu again? Hang on, I, I have to get my face closer to it. Yes, it is, okay. Because I couldn't make it out, mainly because the, the letter didn't fully imprint. Uh, mu absorption, lecture by Reynolds from Princeton for five minutes, followed by uh, mass from pi mu decay by Booth from Columbia, five minutes of lecture, and then 10 minutes of discussion, a total of 120 minutes during that first block at the conference. Um, then we have experiments with pi and Tau. I'm just taking a stab here. I do not know my Greek letters by sight, except for a very specific few of them. Um, Mason, Chairman Oppenheimer, 2 to 5 p.m. 
I, I do not know that letter. Uh, so Pi Mason, Angular, which apparently now are called Pion or Peon. Uh, Angular, it's spelled Peon, but it's I, I assume pronounced Pion. Uh, Angular distribution of Pi or positive Pi in Pi Pi collisions. Or sorry, that's proton proton collisions. Absorption of negative Pi in hydrogen and deuterium. 30-minute lecture by Panofsky from Berkeley. The grad students are called peons. It, does that happen to be Tau? The capital T. That's Tau. Okay. I thought it was, but I wasn't 100% certain, so I wanted to con confirm. Um, So 30 minute lecture by Panofsky followed by 40 minutes of discussion. And then we have 10 minute lecture from Bernardini about interaction of mu mesons with nuclei, uh, followed by five minutes from Wilson from Cornell and then 15 minutes of discussion. So many famous names. Um, I didn't know we had this. And, and then when I discovered, and I was like, oh my god, this is actually pretty cool stuff, uh, I knew I had to stream about it. And I discovered it because I was looking for stuff about the nuclear reactor. Um, and so when I was searching for stuff about the nuclear reactor, I came across this stuff about high energy physics. Uh, five minute lecture on possible electron decay by Rainwater from Columbia. Uh, and then five minutes of discussion. Then multiple production, angular distribution of hard showers. Uh, Bristol work reported by Shapiro. So this is the, that cosmic rays stuff. Uh, high energy mesons in extensive air showers by Grison from Cornell for five minutes, a discussion of 35 minutes. Then tau mesons, uh, evidence for tau mesons uh, by Rossi from MIT, five minutes. Evidence for Tau Mason's uh, by Manchester, but the work reported by Shapiro for five minutes. Ten minutes of discussion, a total of 180 minutes. Ironically, the hard showers have nothing to do with rainwater. Uh, key squared, I think that deserves points if Lord Portico is still around to give them. Um, the third segment happening from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. So this is an all-day affair. Um, experiments with photons and electrons. Uh, Chairman Betha. Meson production by photons. Energy dependence of pi positive cross-section uh, cursed 10 minutes. Um, the negative pi to positive pi ratio, Wilson from Cornell. Pi to the zero power? Or is that pi degrees? I don't know what that is signifying. It's pi and then it looks like a degree, like as in like degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. But it could be something else. It could be like a lowercase o, um, in which case I suppose that would be uh, pi to the omicron, or omicron pi, pi omicron production in hydrogen. Oh, it's zero. Okay, so it's a, it's a, a neutral pi. It's pi zero. See, I wasn't sure, and I wasn't sure because it didn't look like the other zeros. It looked like a, a letter o. Um, which is why I wasn't, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, neutral pi production in hydrogen, Panofsky, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of discussion. Photon interaction with nuclei, stars, Kikuchi, 10 minutes, 5 minutes discussion. And we know from reading people's mail that um, Kikuchi I, I, we could dig into it 
to be sure. I'm not certain whether Kikuchi was initially invited or whether Kikuchi was added after the acceptance from, um, what's his name? Uh, Yukawa. Because Hideki Yukawa indicated that Kikuchi would be interested in attending. And so uh, we would have to go back and dig back through to see, was Kikuchi included because of Yukawa? Uh, I would actually be really curious about that. You had a professor who always used lowercase, zero, lowercase o as zero in superscripts, even on PowerPoints because of his old typewriter. If he put a zero in a superscript, it ran into the next line above. And you know, that's probably why it's this way. It just, to me, I wasn't certain because we've had superscripts that were Greek letters. And so I wasn't sure if this was an Omicron. Um, and it's the same exact symbol that gets used for like degrees Fahrenheit. So it could be degrees. Uh, so yeah, I wasn't certain what the usage was, but that's I think because I was not, I'm not familiar with specific notations in atomic physics or particle physics. Um, electromagnetic effects, absorption of photons, de wire from Cornell, uh, Bremsstrahlung of electrons by de wire from Cornell. What the heck is Bremsstrahlung? Tridents. Bristol work reported by Shapiro. And then we have another thing, proton bremstrelon. Okay, I have to look this word up. I do not know this word. B-R-E-M-S-S-T-R-A-H-L-U-N-G. Uh, bremstrelon, from bremson to break, and uh, strelung, radiation. Um, it as breaking radiation or deceleration radiation is electromagnetic radiation produced by the deceleration of a charged particle when deflected by another charged particle, typically an electron by an atomic nucleus. The moving particle loses kinetic energy, which is converted into radiation, it as protons. Uh, thus satisfying the law of conservation of energy. The term is also used to refer to the process of producing the radiation. Bremstrahlung has a continuous spectrum, which becomes more intense and whose peak intensity shifts toward higher frequencies as the charge of energy of the decelerated particles increases. It's the glowy bits around a reaction. I love that explanation of it, T squared. Um, but that's awesome. I, I learned a completely new physics term today. Um, honestly, not surprising because I am not in any way an expert in any sort of physics. I may abide by the laws of physics, but I don't know what they are. Um, <laughs> let's see. This appears to be, so this is the same program, but with notations on it. So, it looks like the proton-proton scattering lectures from Ramsey and Oxley were canceled because they're crossed out. Instead, there's a circle here with a note so I'm assuming that the time that was allotted for Ramsey and Oxley, that their lectures on proton-proton scattering were replaced with a neutron-proton scattering lecture by Pai. <laughs> you appreciate that it seems they got better at moderating the discussions and reining them in when they ran over time as the conference went on. Yeah, I, I don't know, I, but it did seem like the times at least allotted were shorter. I had assumed this was like a schedule and not a reflection of what actually happened. 
but this one, it seems like maybe this was, maybe the handwritten notations are reporting what actually happened instead of, I, I don't know. Although there's no notations about the time. Um, so they definitely had Oppenheimer. Discussion, apparently, I'm assuming discussion and the names listed next to it means that the discussion was led by um, Marshak and Grunchen. Or Grun uh, sorry, Brun Breck Bruckner. That's Bruckner. Wow, B-R-U-E-C-H-N-E-R. -E Took me a minute to parse that in their handwriting, but it's, it's Bruckner. Um, And then here we've got uh, Piccioni's name penned in above discussion, so I'm not sure. I'm, I think this is noting who led the discussions. Um, again, we have Breckner and Marshak, but also it says Wilson from Cornell. But what did they do? Did they lecture alongside Panofsky? Maybe they were prominent in the discussion? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> and down here, just everything's crossed out and it just says Feynman. <laughs> I wonder if somehow Feynman hijacked the discussion and like, Bristol's work as reported by Shapiro about tridents just didn't get presented because Feynman dominated. I, I would be very curious. Uh, and we probably have the papers here to figure it out. Um, lectures by Professor Wolfgang Panofsky, University of California. Public lecture, New Frontiers in Atomic Energy. Uh, Strong Auditorium, River Campus, University of Mo Rochester. Yeah, so that's just a um, promotional note, letting people know that that lecture was happening. Uh, for two seconds, I'm gonna glance at this folder because we, I have run over time, but this one was public relations, and so I wanted to see if it was like advertisements, because that would be kind of neat. Um, uh, it's, a, it's news releases, which are less neat when you don't have time. Uh, but, like I said, we'll be coming back to this collection in one month's time. Um, yeah, it's mostly press releases. Um, so, if anybody wants to take a gander at the finding aid between now and the end of February, and um, get an idea of sort of what you might want to see from this collection, uh, feel free, because I always take viewer requests with regard to what we're looking at on stream. So if there's folders listed that you're particularly interested in seeing, I want to know. Um, but I don't know until you tell me. Uh, as far as my plan for the end of February, for the next time that we, or for the second episode in the High Energy Physics series, um, I'm going to bring back the Rochester Conference stuff. So I have materials here from the 1950 conference, which is the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, the, and then, let's see, so that was 56. The Moscow one that happened at the same time as the sixth one, the seventh one, the eighth one, the ninth one, the tenth one, or at least the same year, the eleventh one, twelfth, thirteenth. And then um, 
I have a whole section on the International Theoretical Physics Conference on Particles and Fields, the 14th Conference, 15th Conference, U.S. Soviet Scientific Relations, International Union of Pure and Applied Sciences, or sorry, Pure and Applied Physics, uh, as well as some miscellany, uh, miscellany, I suppose is how you say that. But um, that's what I have. So we can look at any of those. It might be interesting to look at some of the Russian stuff, uh, USSR conference or stuff like that uh, next time. Um, but yeah, and uh, you're welcome to get in touch. Uh, you can visit the Special Collections website, which is um, if I can actually type it. Wow, this is my brain on trying to get to the end of the day, apparently. Um, doop -a -doop -a -doo, uh, I could also give our department has a Twitter. Uh, so you're welcome to look for contact information on our website and reach out that way if there's something in particular about Archival Adventures or this topic, uh, this collection that you particularly would like to see on an episode. You can reach out that way or uh, you're also welcome to reach out on our Twitter, which I just have to remember exactly what it is, because it's not my Twitter, it is the departmental Twitter. Uh, and I'm vamping slightly while I look that up. Uh, come on, there it is. It is at VT underscore S-C-U-A, um, which is at V-T S-C-U-A. Uh, come on. So you're welcome to tweet at us um, at, at V-T uh, V T Skua uh, if you've got stuff about the show that you want to, um, to share. Uh, do feel welcome to do so there. Uh, let me see where we're going to raid and I will tell you a little bit about um, next week. I am just trying to get my computer to do things the way that I want it to do things. Um, going so slow. All right. Options for raids today include Stephen Joyce, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Penny Arcade, Geekly. I wonder... Just had to look. Occasionally, I just need to look and see if anybody's streaming history or science or archives other than me. Uh, but there's not, at least not right now. Yeah, no, it's just me. So. We could go and see some sea lions, sea otters, sorry, not sea lions. Um, I think that, that seems good after our physics discussion. Wind down with some lovely, lovely sea otter stuff. Uh, next week, I have a, um, let me get this started real quick. Come on. Wow, everything is just really slow right now for me today. Um, yes, next week 
on the program. I have uh, something. I indeed have something on the program next week. Uh, I lost the tab. Uh, Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities of Montgomery County, Virginia. So that is what I have next week. Uh, the High Energy Physics series will continue at the end of February. Final Wednesday of every month is when that will be happening. Um, but I have the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities next week. I have a bunch of single folder black history collections the week after. Um, then stuff from the Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action here at Virginia Tech. Uh, and then it'll be time for high energy physics. And immediately after that, at the beginning of March, is the 100th episode. And hopefully it'll be exciting. But um, yeah, I hope, that, uh, I hope that you all have a good afternoon. Thank you all for joining me. I hope I see you again soon. Uh, until I do, bye. And we are...